Good morning. My name is Susan Reardon. I'm the staff hearing officer, and I call the meeting of Wednesday, January 19th to order. Today we have three <coughs> items on the agenda, and I haven't received any requests for continuances, postponements, or withdrawals. So I will hear them uh, in the order that they appear on the agenda. But before I get started, I do want to take a moment just to do a moment of silence just to recognize those that we lost in our recent mudslides, those that are still missing, and just the community as a whole. So if you just bear with me. Thank you. Um, so uh, under announcements and appeals, I do want to announce that last Thursday, January 11th, the Planning Commission held a public hearing on an appeal of a project located at 1540 Franceschi Road. Um, it was a partial denial of a front setback modification, and they actually upheld the appeal on a 4-3 vote. Uh, so that, that portion of the project is now approved, and their appeal period runs 10 days from that date. Is there anybody in the audience who would like to address the staff hearing officer on items not on today's agenda? Seeing no one, we'll go to the first item, which is 29 East Cabrillo Boulevard, if the applicant would like to come up to the table. Good morning. Anytime you're ready, Allison. Okay, thank you. The project site is 14,148 square feet and it is located on East Cabrillo Boulevard. It extends uh, the entire width between Helena Avenue and Anna Kappa Street. The site is currently developed with two structures. One is a um, approximately 711 square foot one story structure and the other is an approximately 8,350 square foot two-story structure. Um, since the two-story building was constructed, the site was rezoned to HRC2, which requires 20-foot front setbacks for structures that are greater than 15 feet in height. So the existing structure is non-conforming to front setbacks. The um, required setback for the property is shown with the blue line and the existing building footprint is the dark gray. You can also see then the roof overhangs beyond that. The project is a remodel of the existing building um, with some additions and some removals of existing building footprints. Uh, the proposed building footprint is a little difficult to see, but it's shown um, outlined with the yellow line. As I said, the project would demolish some areas of the building to create some outdoor seating areas. Overall, the amount of floor area in the setback would be reduced by approximately 600 square feet. A new entrance feature would add a taller mass in a portion of the structure. And we can take a look at the elevations to see how that looks. <coughs> So the elevation at the top, this is the view from Cabrillo Boulevard, and the area in yellow would be the new two-story structure. You can compare it to um, the image below, which shows the existing structure from Cabrillo Boulevard. And uh, if we turn to the next page, we can see the elevations from other vantage points. This is the um, east elevation of the building, so Cabrillo Boulevard would be on the left. And, um, so you can, if you compare it to the bottom, you can see areas where it's, the structure is pulled back, this existing structure is removed, and this is the new structure um, that extends above the height of the existing roof. And this is the... Um, North elevation, which doesn't um, relate to the um, modification request. And this is the west elevation. And again, you can see the new uh, two-story tower that would be within the um, required setback. The project has been reviewed several times by the Historic Landmarks Commission, who found the changes to be an aesthetic improvement 
to the building. <coughs> um, staff is supportive of the requested setback modifications uh, because they allow for an appropriate improvement on the lot. They allow for the adaptive reuse of an existing non-conforming building. And they also reduce the amount of floor area that is within the setback. So they're opening it up uh, more uh, in terms of the view from the street than what exists today. Um, so that concludes staff's report, and I can answer any questions that you have. Thank you. I do have some questions, but I would like to hear from the applicant first, and then I might ask for them. So would you like to state your name for the record? And Absolutely. Additional comments? And Edward Devasende, <coughs> architect with DMHA. Um, and I'm staff hearing officer and staff. Um, <clears throat> this property is about 45 years old. And just taking a look at the photos, it's been a center. There's two two buildings on the property, but there's one main building, which is the the um, applic applied for modification today. <coughs> Excuse me. So just we have some photos here just to look around the building, and so primarily it's been a single restaurant user, and on the corner of Ana Capa and Cabrillo is where the main entrance is. So the challenge of this building over the years has been just how closed it is to the neighborhood. So it's a very small and not that inviting uh, entry point, which you can see here from the corner. And then as you go along um, Cabrillo, the dining is very enclosed and has really a low, a fairly low roof pitch. So. When, uh, this is a new owner that purchased this at the end of last year and has looked at repositioning it. And one of the, the strategies was to divide it up into smaller te uh, tenant spaces to support. Um, the strategy is to, just for a longer term success rather than having one large tenant. So our team took a look at how do we improve the building and its siting uh, and, and just relationship to the neighborhood and the public sidewalks that surround the property by on three sides. It's a very constrained lot. Um, all the parking for it is actually to the lot at the rear and has been uh, since the building was built in early 70s. So because of the rezone, as staff mentioned, there's very little that we can do to the exterior facade that doesn't trigger the modification. The 20-foot setbacks, things as simple as because it's a flood zone, it's raised a bit off the street. Anything uh, from a patio standpoint that's higher 10 inches triggers a modification. Um, and anything related to the facade of you know, changing openings really triggers the modification, which is why we're here before you. As staff mentioned, we've been to the HLC about four, maybe five times, fine-tuning this, and they've very, been very supportive all along, and it's just been an effort to uh, take a look at the building and really max working with them to maximize uh, all components of it, not just the ground level, but also on the second floor. Uh, you can see in this photo there's there's a, a residence that's currently uh, up there, and the tenant in the middle, the new demising, demise space, would like to create access to that, and um, part of the, our proposal, our application, is conversion of that to commercial space. So staff mentioned uh, there's a number of places where the interior uh, dining, which is very closed off, the facades are getting pulled back, and it's creating outdoor dining opportunities for us. So we've created a little exhibit just to more clearly show, kind of look at the overall dining areas. Um, so in the existing building, it's all interior dining, and it's uh, these are approximates. It's about 4,141 square feet currently with no exterior square footages. And we have a, a spreadsheet summary of this as well. This is just reference today for uh, for the presentation. Um, approximate and our proposed, uh, now that we have tenant improvements drawings in process, we have a better idea of the proposed interior and, out uh, interior and uh, exterior dining spaces. So this is excluding uh, bars, back of house areas, et cetera. So again, approximately. And you can see the two restaurant spaces and their approximate sizes, interior 1464 and 1383, and then the new exterior components. And the key is really on the corner uh, where the old entry was. We're closing it off uh, with, with the walls, and again, um, it's about two feet from the sidewalk. So we're accessing it from the interior and then just have an emergency exit stair off of that to Anacapa. Uh, tenant uh, A's entry with flanking outdoor dining, 
and also tenant B uh, adjacent to their entry. The pushback uh, previous interior dining space is now exterior is about 510 square feet. So on the second floor is the last component again for tenant B. Going up the interior space would be converted into a bar um, lounge type of area about 424 square feet and an exterior component of approximately 400 square feet um, up there. So as you can see in the spreadsheet we kind of go towards the totals if you don't mind. Thank you. So where we had in uh, uh, currently about 4,141 interior square feet the new interior numbers is 3,271 so losing eight 900 square feet and the interior exterior dining is 1,600 or so square feet so as a uh, total it results in an increase project wide of about 741 square feet. Primarily that's due to the conversion of the second floor is really where that comes from. The ground floor um, and the adjustments from inter to exter nearly balance out. Let's see, I think that covers all the key points. Um, the exterior drawings are in here. Um, I don't think we need to go through the merits of the design, the HLC has done that and there's great rec good record of that. But certainly I'm here to answer any questions with regard to the setback issues, um, the dining, interior, exterior, any questions you might have. Okay, great. I do have questions. Um, regarding the, um, the parking area, uh, given what you're, you're requesting is removal of, of interior square footage and replacement with exterior seating type mm -hmm. thing, I need to have an understanding of how the parking works. And in the staff report, it, it discusses that there's uh, 23 spaces back in this area uh, that's available for parking. Um, and here's this is shown as parking, um, so I just wanted to understand how the parking works for the site, and then also um, the project ends in, ends up losing one parking space for an ADA, and our code allows for that without a modification if there's not a change of use involved, and there is a change of use involved. There's the residents on the second floor going to commercial, so um, I need to understand why um, that's allowed without the approval of a modification request too, and I don't know. If you want to talk about parking and you want to talk about the agreement or... or yeah, I can start and then um, Mr. DeVicente, if you need to fill in any details. So the existing portion of the site at the corner, I apologize, I didn't include that in the um, project statistics. Um, it is a building with the last recognized use was a fast food restaurant. They, on those original plans, they identified six parking spaces as the required parking for that use. Since that time... The city has um, closed off the driveway access to those parking spaces so they can no longer be accessed from Cabrillo Boulevard. So that creates um, usability issues in terms of uh, they don't function any longer without that. And so staff is working with the applicant to create a, um, a feasible site plan for how many parking spaces can be accommodated on that site and actually work. Um, none work under our current requirements, but we're just trying to find the maximum number of spaces that can be accommodated um, as close to our requirements as possible, given the situation of not only closing off this driveway easement or driveway apron, but also there was a 10-foot dedication when this structure was built, and so that also reduces the maneuverability of those spaces, and that easement was to allow for sidewalk widening. Okay, what do you... What, what? When I went to the site and I saw these pictures too, it's not being used for parking. It's being used for surreys, although this is vacant. Uh, isn't Correct. that a zoning violation? That is a zoning violation, yes. And is it under enforcement right now? I don't believe it's under enforcement, but the owner does have an application for a um, project that does not include the surrey use, and I believe that owner has found an alternate site. Well, operate. yeah, the building, it's this looks like it move down the street and it has more surreys out in front of there which is another zoning violation so there's like you have bikes all over um, the area yeah. okay yeah I don't believe we have any active enforcement cases on it okay and then with regard to the parking on the adjacent site uh, there was a an agreement in 1970 when this restaurant was built that allowed for the 23 parking spaces off-site on this adjacent lot um, with this project, we would update that agreement and do our uh, standard off-site parking agreement um, just to bring the terms up to current 
language. Uh, we no longer use the term unilateral agreement. And so we just want to update everything with this current proposal. Um, the reason that we felt that the loss of the one space to accommodate the accessible parking space was consistent with the code is that even though it talks about the change of use, um, this site was parked for a 250 square foot restaurant. That's, sorry, 250 seat restaurant. That's how the agreement was drafted, was to serve a, a restaurant with 250 seats. So even though the apartment is becoming part of the restaurant, the overall number of seats within the restaurant has not changed. So staff's uh, determination was that that um, was consistent with um, what we would allow. Um, the other thing that's just a, a note is this parking lot gets updated with the tenant improvements taking place on the adjacent site. So that's actually what, um, what is triggering it. Um, because the spaces aren't on this lot, these tenant improvements don't trigger it per se. But these spaces, OK, so then did you read the whole record or just the agreement? What, was, what parking requirement was established for the unit? And where was that to be provided? It was not addressed. Um, so the um, agreement, even for the office space that's on the second floor, none of that was addressed. It was the agreement. This entire structure was built at one time, but the agreement was just written to serve the 250-seat restaurant. So um, I guess you could interpret it that that also covered the uses above, or the uses above have no parking, uh, depending on how you uh, interpret that agreement, but it, it definitely was not clear. I, I'm not sure I agree with that reasoning today in terms of what the code says. The, the, the agreement back then didn't allow for the allowance to remove a parking space for handicap. Today's code does allow for that. It was amended back in 2008, so that's an, a recent thing. And so before then, you couldn't even do it. You'd need to get a mod. And so it, this is a change of use and that I believe additional parking space you can't lose a parking space um, with the conversion of it. Um, the other question I have uh, is regarding the, the use of so this area, and it all relates again with parking, um, but I guess it doesn't affect your seats. The area, it, it crosses property lines. Is, is there a lot tie agreements right here, the service area? It's, it's on this property, but it's accessed from this way. I don't know whose service area it is, but now it's being incorporated into the building, and it's crossing the property line. Um, so either the parcels or the parcels going to be merged later on, or a lot tie agreement, or how is this being authorized for this being incorporated into the restaurant? So there is an existing unilateral agreement that allows this service area to serve this building, okay. um, that will be updated to be a lot tie agreement okay. uh, with the new project, and it can address the unilateral agreement also addressed all the openings that were right on the property line, and so okay. those types of things will all be incorporated into a new lot tie agreement. Okay. So then the parking now is not, it will be the off-site parking agreement, or will it be just a section in that with the lot tie? It will be a section in the lot tie agreement. Okay. Do you have anything to add in the parking? About the parking? Um, sure. Just, uh, I mean, you don't have to, but I'm just wondering if you're listening and you wanted to add something in. Mm -hmm. yes. um, I think it's an understatement to say that this, uh, the, the buildings have remained the way they are because the zoning, underlying zone, is just very complicated. So, uh, again, we have a new owner that um, uh, took control of both uh, the 11 and a Kappa parcel and the Cabrillo parcel. So, where in the past they were different ownership and didn't have the same um, interests. Now we have an owner who's looking to reposition the property the most uh, appropriate way possible and to use the synergies of the two properties to reinforce with, with the, the, the strong points of each. So it takes time to convert these things. There's existing tenancies. Um, on Cabrillo, they've been more... Um, fluid and it was certainly vacant on the restaurant side and the Surrey tenant has moved out again because the owner wasn't interested in non-conforming or enforcement issue excuse me not, not non-conforming but enforcement issues so that is under a separate application currently mm -hmm. and similarly uh, the tenancies uh, on 11 and a Kappa building um, 
when, as those tenant agreements expire, they have the ability to bring in new tenants. So there's also ABR is the review body for this project property here and has approved uh, a new tenant on a portion of the building and a new uh, accessibility path from each side. Also, restriping and re-landscaping of the entire parking lot that serves both properties. Uh, we've worked with transportation very closely to maximize the number of spaces we could achieve. We've had a CalCASP expert review all aspects of the property and help us with accessibility, both from a parking and a pedestrian access standpoint to each of the doors. Um, again, this building is raised up because it's in a flood zone and the, and the front doors have challenges with regard to accessibility. So applications are currently in progress and building um, to address um, the site. Um, as you see here, again, it's already approved, been approved by ABR and uh, one of the tenancies that's in here. So as, as things move along, the site plan um, has already been solved and will address the 29 tenants that are before you today, the 23 tenant is going to have its own parking issues to deal with, and they'll deal with that independently because it didn't have a historical tie here, so this, that'll be a separate thing. But for the tenancies of 11 and a Kappa and 29 East Cabrillo, uh, we've come up with a parking plan with transportation support that will su uh, support, uh, again, from a non-conforming status, um, the both uses. So. That's uh, where we're at relative to the site design. Um, so all those upgrades are currently under permit uh, or plan check review. And uh, it's been favorable so far through all the departments. So it's really just dotting the I's and crossing the T's. Um, if you have any other questions specific to how the two relate, I think staff's addressed it properly with the lot tie agreement. And that's the mechanism we've all agreed to. Yeah. Um, but I can certainly answer any additional questions you might have. So this parking lot here, um, it's shared between the two uses, right? Because this area here has more than 23 parking spaces in Correct. it. So it's, it's available for those two. Correct. Okay. All right. Uh, then the other question I have, okay. Oh, actually, I, do, I did receive a public comment, but I had the question too. Um, this project is located in the coastal zone, and I know the, the, the um, request before me is just a front setback modification. That, and there is a, one statement in the uh, staff report that says it appears to qualify for a, a coastal exclusion. Uh, and I just need that explained more to me because um, the... It involves the removal of square footage, the legalization of square footage, the conversion of use. There's a lot of stuff going on, and it's on Cabrillo Boulevard, which is, uh, which is identified as a scenic resource. It's not designated, but it's in our coastal plan. It talks about the importance of development along Cabrillo Boulevard. Um, and so just I would like that explained more on the process. It does say in here that it's not a final determination, um, that it appears to qualify for one. Um, but just if you can explain a little more um, sure. that statement. So in determining whether or not the project qualifies for a coastal exemption, we use the city zoning ordinance, which um, identifies improvements to any structure other than a single-family residence, provided that those improvements which involve a risk of adverse environmental effect or adversely affect public access or result in a change of use contrary to any policy of the Coastal Act shall require a coastal development permit. And it also refers to Section 13253 of Title 14 of the California Administrative Code, um, which also talks about an improvement to a structure which changes the intensity of use of the structure. And so as staff reviews those, you know, the key points are um, whether the project will affect public access. And the two key components to that uh, relate to parking and traffic generation. So those are two of the key things that we look at. In terms of the change of intensity of use, uh, the existing structure is a restaurant. Um, there's also a residence and the office above. Uh, the office will remain, um, but the use itself is remaining a restaurant, even though um, it's expanding into the um, residential unit. The way that the city calc calculates um, parking requirements is based on seats rather than square footage. So because it's re remaining as a maximum of 250 seats, uh, we believe that it is not changing 
the intensity of use. Um, and then with regard to the outdoor seating, the city has a um, long-standing policy. It's been in place almost 20 years where we consider outdoor seating to be an ancillary use uh, to the primary use as long as that outdoor seating is less than 50% of the interior seating. And so in this case, that's what is being proposed. So based on that, the project is not triggering an increase in the number of required parking spaces. And so um, that's how we've come to the conclusion that it uh, would qualify for the exemption. And that is consistent with how we've reviewed other projects in this area um, over the last 20 years. Okay, so on the plans, it indicates that there's um, going to be 125 interior seats for each restaurant and 62 exterior for each restaurant. Um, the total outside eating area, I did it, at, I calculated as 1666, which is close to your number, 1611. Have you looked at it to see if um, the number of 62 seats, is that realistic number outside? I know there's notes on the plans that says no unauthorized expansion, but you've been involved in enforcement, and I have too, that over time, you can have all notes on the plans, but the spaces there are that's going to be filled with seats. So have you looked, is that a realistic indication of the number, or what kind of enforcement mechanism is going to be there that the number of seats isn't going to increase? So we have um, started looking at the seat configuration um, through the tenant improvements that are being submitted. And um, I believe there's actually a discrepancy in what I saw initially. It looks like maybe there were fewer outdoor seats than what's called out on this plan. But that's something that we will be looking at very closely with their building um, plan submittals. We do want the um, what's uh, documented on the plans to be fairly realistic. You know, we don't want a giant area where it shows two seats, yeah. you know, we, um, but what I've seen so far, the seating layout uh, looks realistic and like it um, will work and is not, um, there's no excessive open space. Um, and so we, we will definitely be checking those things very closely to make sure that the, the seats remain as identified. And when we need to do enforcement, we do enforcement. If we get complaints or if, mm -hmm. if there's an issue, um, we have done that. Um, on other projects, and we would do that here if that came up. Mm -hmm. Okay. And you're the architect for it. You, you, uh, you, do you have any response regarding the, the amount of square footage or um, square fo area for the outside seating and the seating seats per square foot, if it's a realistic, although you might not tell me. <laughs> sure. Um. Number one, they're broken into multiple spaces, which reduces the usable area because there's increase of circulation in okay. service areas. Okay. So that's, that's one way um, uh, as well. Um, <clears throat> it's also along Cabrillo Boulevard, so uh, certain times of the day will be more mm, in, um, enjoyable than others. Um, it can get pretty busy out there sometimes. Uh, the opportunity upstairs is, I think, is going to be phenomenal. So that, that's going to be as many people as can get up there. So that's going to be an issue to manage, right. certainly. Um, in our current designs, which are under development right now in the TIs, it's a more casual layout of space. So we're contemplating a fireplace and some of those other elements yeah. that, again, don't encourage tightly packed seats necessarily. Um, but it's certainly something that is to be managed, and it's an issue of all of the funk zone. Um, mm -hmm. And it leads to bigger discussions of parking issues in the funk zone. And, you know, it's just a wonderful resource that we have of these buildings in, in this neighborhood in the proximity to uh, to the ocean and, and the upgrade of the neighborhood that's occurred. So it's something we're very, um, we, take, we, we look at very closely, which is why I work with ABR and HLC very closely, because our intent is always to set up our clients and the tenants to be successful in the long term, and having realistic designs and seating layouts is critical. So... We've been working on these for over a year with staff, again, multiple reviews on both properties, and uh, our intention has always been with the new owner to clean up the issues and set them up to succeed for the long term without enforcement issues by design. So, yes, it's, uh, it's something we've taken very, looked at very closely and advised the tenants of. That is a management issue as they move ahead. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Great. Thank you. So I'd like to open the public hearing. Is there anyone here in the audience who'd like to address the staff hearing officer on 29 East Cabrillo Boulevard? 
No, see, no one, like I said, I received an email and it was from Accessible Santa Barbara. Um, and they expressed concerns regarding um, <coughs> the reason for the coastal development permit, why it's, why it's considered to be exempt. Um, and did you receive a copy of this letter? Yes, we did. Um, and, and staff, again, like I said, that's not my. That's not before me today. It's a. Um, there's a statement in the staff report, and my action today, in no way. Um, it, it doesn't solidify that. It doesn't agree that it's exempt, and it's not saying that it requires a CDP. I'm going to be mute on that point, um, but because the request before me is on. Um, the front setback modification, and again, I had the same question, and certain staff has explained that it's consistent with the other determinations we've made in the coastal zone. So um, I'll close the public hearing. I did go out to the site, like I said, and the, uh, and I actually used to go to El Torito when it's there, so I'm familiar with the building, the parking, and, and that sort of situation. Um, in regards to the requested front setback, uh, you need it for two streets, given it's on the front it's on three street corners, so on the Anacapa Street frontage and on the Cabrillo Street frontage. And in regards to the Anacapa Street, street frontage, um, a lot of times when we look at front setback modifications, it, especially in this situation, it's the streetscape and the whole setting and how it fits in with the neighborhood and take into consideration what the HLC reviewed. And I've looked at their minutes and they you know, went into a lot of detail. And, um, and it, as Allison pointed out, you are removing square footage from the setback areas, so opening it up um, and adding outdoor dining in this area actually, I think, adds to the whole feeling of the area. It encourages people to come down there and makes it vital, vital and stuff. So in regards to the actual building improvements, it is supportable. Um, my concern, though, can you, continues to be with the parking uh, situation. It's tough all over the waterfront in the funk zone like you mentioned. Mm -hmm. um, so I, the city needs to be really careful in improving additional or changes to buildings that we're not impacting that. And we do have this longstanding policy that we don't look at the outside seating if it's less than 50%. However, I'm looking at the existing situation. And this, this parking area here, um, although it's not identified to be used for this building, it is on the same lot. And therefore, um, if I were to approve the project, I would put a condition on that these surreys need to be removed um, uh, within 30 days of the action, and this area needs to be re uh, available for parking because it is, it's supposed to be parking. It's not surrey parking. It needs to be removed. It's a zoning violation, and this is a discretionary application, and it needs to be removed. The other condition that I would put on the project is that this space needs to be replaced. It, our code doesn't allow for it in this type of situation, and I understand that the, the use overall is going to be remained restaurant, but it does involve that change of use, and so I would put a condition that that space needs to be replaced. And if, um, if for some reason that determination is decide, um, decided by community development director that that's not a requirement, it could be found consistent with my action. Um, but uh, I do not agree that this does not involve a change of use. It is a very small change of use, but parking is at a premium in this area, and any loss is an impact to it. And you mm -hmm. already are non-conforming. You already don't meet the parking demand nor the requirement. And so um, for all those reasons, I, I believe that section of the code does not pertain to the situation. So I would require that that space be removed, I mean, be replaced. Uh, Um, so, so with those two added conditions, um, I can make the findings outlined in the staff report regarding the environmental determination as well as the two findings related to the setback modifications and uh, subject to those two new conditions. And my action is appealable to the Planning Commission within 10 calendar days. Mm -hmm. And they also have oversight authority of all my actions. And if they felt this addi uh, required additional discussion before them, they could call it up during that same 10-day review period. Mm -hmm. and if that would, either of those would happen, Allison will contact you. Great. Okay? Thank you. Thanks. Uh -huh.
Um, Allison, you, you'd like to keep those, correct? Yes. As shown in the hearing. Great, thank you. You're welcome. The next item is 240 Mohawk, if the applicant would like to come up. You can come up too. Oh, that was, yes, here. Good morning. Good morning. Oh, great, thank you. Anytime you're ready, Allison. Thank you. This is a proposal for a new accessory dwelling unit at 240 Mohawk. The parcel is 6,241 square feet and is located on the Mesa. It is currently developed with a 1,189 square foot single family residence and a detached 350 square foot garage. Um, over on the left is the existing site plan. Um, the garage is proposed to be converted to an accessory dwelling unit and would include a 228 square foot addition resulting in a 561 square foot accessory dwelling unit. So I want to um, be clear that today's hearing, the public hearing, is only to discuss the requested modifications. The project does require two interior setback modifications. It also requ um, requires a coastal development permit because the accessory dwelling unit is detached. However, um, the public hearing uh, will not be to discuss the, the merits of that coastal development permit. So the existing garage is non-conforming to two interior setbacks. Um, proposed alterations to the building that are within the required interior setbacks, um, which is shown in yellow, uh, require the modifications. Additionally, the proposed addition to the garage, there's a small portion of it that is within the required setback, and that requires a modification. So the alterations to the existing structure that are within this northern interior setback include a change to the roof pitch. Uh, the existing roof pitch is essentially flat. It has a very small pitch um, towards the center. Um, and so that would be changing with this proposal uh, more to match the existing residents. And also the conversion of some of the garage floor area into storage because um, it's being converted into a use that is not um, part of the accessory dwelling unit that does require a modification. And then within this eastern interior setback, the changes include the change to the roof pitch, as I mentioned, also a new window in the wall, and the addition um, to that structure. And we can take a look at the elevations to see how it will affect those. Um, I will note some of the, the roof changes are difficult to see in the two-dimension um, drawing, but um, this is the view of the structure from the street, and so it's this change in roof pitch that requires uh, the setback modification. If we look at the structure um, from the rear, again, it's the change in roof pitch, a new window, and then also this portion of the building that is within the setback, and that is because the building wall is being extended out in a straight line whereas the property line is at an angle, so a portion of it is in the setback. I do want to clarify that the window on this elevation is not drawn in exactly the same location as it is on the floor plan. The intent is that the window is entirely within um, that setback area as shown on the floor plan. And then if we look at, um, this is the northern property line, and again, it's this change in roof pitch that requires the setback modification and then also the change of use to storage. Staff is supportive of these requested modifications because uh, the proposed changes are an appropriate improvement on the lot and they will not materially affect the adjacent neighbors. That concludes staff's report and I can answer any questions that you have. Thank you. All right, great, thank you. I'll wait for this. Um, would you like to state your name for the record and provide additional comments? Yes, my name is Rochelle Malin. I'm the agent for uh, Joe Gagneau, the owner. Do you want to say your name? Or? Joseph Gagneau. I'm the owner of the property. Okay. Would you like to add anything? Or? Um, just uh, 
I suppose just the original garage that's here is, although it's classified as a two-car garage, really only accommodates a single car. Uh -huh. <laughs> and uh, so you're not, we're not losing a two covered spaces. So uh, we just feel that this is, uh, uh, this is conducive to the site uh, with a long driveway extended. And uh, we, did, we didn't put any windows, of course, over here. And uh, the majority of the development is to the interior existing uh, property, so there's little uh, impact to any of the adjacent neighbors. Okay. So in, in terms of the, um, the change in the height and the setback, this is illustrated. What, is this less than two feet or? Uh, than existing? Yeah, I don't know. It would, it would be... Uh, I may imagine it's from the existing roof to this, it's probably somewhere between two feet to 30 inches in increase in, in height. Okay, and then um, the other question um, I had, because the, the two, like Allison says, the public hearing here is in regards to the requested modifications versus the coastal development permit. You do need the coastal development permit. There's policies um, that are outlined in the, in the staff report. Um, you know, the, the status uh, directed that the additional unit is not considered a unit for density and all that, so it's all that's considered it's consistent. So I'm looking at mainly the um, modification aspects of it. So in terms of the windows in the setback, because windows and openings generally have the most conflict between neighbors, mm -hmm. and looking at your window schedule, this is you know one large room. It has a fixed window, and then the, the bathroom has two operable windows. Uh, I was wondering with the code, building code, this is going to be the sleeping area. Does this need to be operable? Is that okay for it to be fixed? Well, actually, we are going to go ahead and make it operable. Okay. Um, but building code, no, it would not be required because we have access, direct access to for an exit from this room. Okay. Yes. All for right. The doors. Correct. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking of the interior. Like this one requires to have the egress because you exit into the house. Correct. Yes. Okay. That's why. Um, okay. Because then my question is um, again with the, being the distance. Um, to the neighbors, I would prefer this to remain fixed. Okay. And then the other one, if it's in the setback, to be fixed also. This is operable. This could be used for the required ventilation, mm -hmm. um, just for the conflicts between the, the, the neighbors. Um, okay. Is that acceptable? Yeah, we, we initially submitted it with a fixed window, and I think staff came back recommending that it would be an operable window. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. That's why we flip-flopped here. Yeah. yeah. Okay, that's fine. All right. Um, that was just one of my, my two questions was what was the height change? Um, and then s solar, did you review it for solar? It wasn't required. Okay, with the modification request. Um, well, I'm, I wouldn't say it wasn't required. There was no impact on any. Okay, that's what you mean. Okay. Yes. Because with the, oh yeah, here, four, here we go. Uh, no, that's the change. Because here's the north property right. line. I have, may have just done it myself because um, it's not shown on the drawings. Um, but we will we, confirm that. Uh, yes, because we did review that and it wasn't an impact. Okay. Because it's, it's a supportable modification as long as it doesn't affect solar. So um, I could put a condition on that if it's found to be a uh, conflict with the solar requirements that it needs to be reduced to comply with it. Okay. Uh, because it is a height modification request. But, uh, first, I'd like to open the public hearing. I have a request to speak from Roger Swartz, if you'd like to come up to the table. Usually what we have him do is sit in the table there, at the table. Good morning. Hello. Good morning. I'm Roger Swartz. I'm uh, the neighbor across the street at 239 Mohawk. And I just wanted to put some support to uh, my neighbor because uh, I think it will be an improvement to the neighborhood. Uh, I think the improvements that he's doing will add value to all of our neighbors. Uh, that's simply what I wanted to profess. Okay, great. Thank you for coming down. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Is there anyone else who would like to address the staff hearing officer on 240 Mohawk Road? 
See, no one. Um, I, have, I didn't receive any letters or anything in my packet. Is there any additional emails or phone calls? Okay. okay, I'll close the public hearing. Um, I did go out to the site, as you know. You met me at the site when I was out there uh, and, and looked at the property in the neighborhood and the adjoining uses. And again, like I said in my comments, the concern is related to solar and the windows. So um, I can make the findings outlined in the staff report uh, regarding the interior setback modifications as well as the cultural development permit uh, with the, the, those two conditions with the project showing compliance with the solar access. the solar access ordinance, and then with the, the two windows that are within the setback be op, uh, inoperable. And um, just for clarification, um, I don't know if it would come up later on at plan check. If you move the window over and it's out of the setback, would that condition apply? No, it wouldn't. It's only if it's within the setback. So, right. Um, I understand. Okay. Thank you. Right. Some people do say, well, there's that condition, and so it only applies if it's within the setback. So if the two windows are fixed, and then that shows compliance. Um, the application, it's consistent with the policies in the coastal plan. Uh, the request of modifications, it represents a uniform addition to the building. Uh, it's not proposing to get any closer. It's actually, given the property lines, it kind of uh, slopes away from the property or it angles away from the property. So uh, I make those findings. My action is appealable to the Planning Commission within 10 calendar days. And they also have oversight authority of all my actions. And if they felt this uh, warranted additional discussion before them, they could call it up during that same 10-day review period. And if either of those would occur, Allison would contact you. Okay. Okay? All right. Thank you. Thanks. Huh? So we'll go to the next project, which is 707 through 709 Kimball Avenue. Kelly brought us into community development. The project I'm um, presenting today is located at uh, 707 and 709 Kimball. Um, the two lots combine approximately 8,600 square feet. Um, it's south of 101 and north of Cabrillo, kind of in the East Beach area. And this uh, neighborhood of the city is very diverse. It's developed with a mix of industrial, manufacturing, hotel, motel, residential and public facilities. The project site is currently developed with an existing 33, approximately 3,300 square foot building, this is here highlighted in the green, which is made up um, based on the archive plans, which I have here are um, industrial, warehouse, and office. The proposal would be basically for a twin building adjoining, at, added on to this existing building, which would be 2,900 square feet um, of a non-residential addition. In order to build this uh, addition, the applicant is requesting a coastal development permit to allow the development in the non-appealable jurisdiction of the coastal zone, and also a development plan for new non-residential floor area. Also as part of the project, the applicant is proposing four new parking spots, and they're highlighted here in the, in the pink. The three on this side are existing for this building. Historically, the original building at 709 Kimball was permitted with Approximately 2,800 square feet of warehouse, which would require one space at one per 5,000. Um, 500 square feet of industrial space, which is one space per 500, so that's another space. And 250 square feet of a little tiny office space, which is one space per 250. So that's where they got the three. Um, that's how they got three parking spaces, because that's how the existing building was developed. So basically, the, new, the, the applicant is now requesting to do the same thing, an, an addition, and the new building would be a mix of warehouse, industrial, and office, and they're proposing four new parking spots. 
Um, the addition of non-residential floor area requires a development plan. And Chapter 2885 of the Municipal Code um, be- states that because no additions have taken place on, this, on either of these properties since the implementation of Measure E or the adoption of the non-residential growth management plan, that they still have square footage available from the small and minor categories totaling 3,000 square feet. Um, so in order for staff to recommend approval or recommend the show approve this development plan, um, staff found that the project is consistent with the zoning ordinance and principles of sound community planning, and it will not have an adverse effect on the surrounding neighborhood and aesthetics uh, based on the existing uses in that neighborhood. It's also consistent with the city's traffic management strategy as determined by the Public Works tra- um, Planning Transportation Department. Also, uh, the Coastal Development Permit, staff finds that that uh, application of this project is consistent with the local coastal plan land use designation of industrial, which is what's in this area. Uh, let's see. Um, building supply firms and storage facilities are major uses in this area. And a large area of this um, neighborhood is occupied by the city's wastewater treatment plant. And it's also zoned M1 light manufacturer. So it seems that this proposed addition and use of this building would be consistent with the local coastal plan designation. Also, the project went to design review on two occasions. And the applicants have been working with them, the board to um, come up with a design that uh, ABR is happy with, and they will return to the ABR for further review uh, subsequent to today's hearing. So with that, staff recommends that the staff hearing officer make the findings in the staff report subject to the conditions of approval in Exhibit A. And we do have the architect here, Richard Redman, to make a presentation and the property owner also. Okay, great. Thank you. My so. name is Richard Redman, <laughs> and this is Joe Matt. Joe Matthews, <laughs> I'm sorry, um, representing Architectural Millwork. And currently they uh, are occupying the existing building and they use it strictly for storage of their, um, basically what they produce at the mill shop that they have on uh, Noble. Yeah, on Noble Street. So, and we actually have some pictures of what, What's being stored there is basically all their uh, windows and doors and that kind of thing. And they do some, um, I guess, fabrication or they just use minor tools, you know, to put things together on the site. So it's not a heavy industrial use. Um, what we're proposing is to add, uh, and we thought it was kind of a simple um, project was to add on to this building and actually provide additional storage space for them because currently they're really running out of space where they're, they've actually rented spaces uh, throughout this area to, um, to do general storage of, of their materials. And with all the work that they're doing, obviously they're going to get busier and busier and going to need the space. So um, there is no office use on this addition. What we're proposing is, is basically um, a combination warehouse and industrial use, although initially I think it's all going to be warehouse use. But we'd like to have the flexibility of, of actually having a stipulated uh, industrial use uh, within the space. Um, the, the mezzanine obviously is, is going to be all storage, and I don't think it ever was uh, uh, proposed to be anything different. So that's basically it, and we've, uh, we've, I think we've followed, uh, I think, um, most of the, you know, requirements of the lot that ABI required. We had to do some additional design work, I think, on the front to bring it in line with uh, some existing windows. But again, there's, uh, there's no office use over on this side of the building. Okay. Okay. Great, thank you. Uh, I do have some questions, but I'll open the public hearing. I'm not sure if there's okay. anyone wants to speak. Um, so I'd like to open the public hearing for 1707 through 1709 Kimball Street. Seven, 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 not 17, sorry. Oh, sorry. 707 and 709 Kimball Street. Is there anyone here who would like to address the staff hearing officer? Have we received any letters? Or? No, I have not received any letters. Okay, great. Thank you. I'll close the public hearing. 
Um, I did go out to the site and you know, looked around the neighborhood, and I've been there many times, and it's an industrial area. So whether it's industrial, warehouse, uh, office, and, um, admin office associated with it, that type of use is all consistent with the area. Um, in terms of the building itself, uh, like you said, um, ABR reviewed it, and they were, they were okay with it. There's some minor tweakies, and they want to do, and that's fine. My concern relates to parking. Um, yeah, similar to the first item on the agenda that you heard. Uh, when we look at parking for buildings, we look at the, what the building as a whole is. And in this instance, when I look at your floor plan, and it's good for your discussion, as you said, <clears throat> uh, when I look at the floor plan, it's just this empty building, uh, which correlates with what you were saying in regards <clears throat> that you appear that you, your intent is that it be warehouse. Um, in the legend space here, it talks about the proposed uses, and it breaks it down 2,200 square foot of industrial, 3,500 square feet of west warehouse, and then almost 600 square feet of office. And it breaks the parking down per those areas, but those areas aren't designated in the building. When you have an industrial use, it's common to have areas that are warehouse, where you store your materials because you're going to be using them to make them. It's common to have office associated with that. So... In terms of the parking requirement, we don't break it down this way. And so if it's, you know, we would look at it without more, des without more information as that it would be industrial, one per 500. Um, and then that would trigger the parking. I think when I did the math, it require, I forget how many more, 12 spaces. 12 spaces. So it wouldn't meet the parking requirement um, as proposed and as broken down. Um, you had indicated you wanted flexibility in types of the use. Um, there, and I was trying to think real quick. Um, I didn't bring the coaster regs down. But uh, if this is what you wanted to go forward with and to say that this was the addition is for warehouse only, just for warehouse, still have all these parking spaces at a later date if you needed a transition into something else, we would look at the amount of parking that's provided and then you can designate actual elements, like you know, this area right here is industrial and everything else is storage. Um, and that would not require an, another coastal permit. It would more than likely be able to be found exempt or excluded from the requirements of a coastal permit. We still need to do some kind of review. But as is proposed now with this breakdown in, um, and the project description, it doesn't meet the parking requirement, so I couldn't approve a coastal permit. So does, does the entire building have to be... Um say a warehouse use, is that it? Or, or if this has already been approved as a combination of spaces, um, can we designate, you know, what's in there now? I think there's 500 square feet of industrial space and the rest warehouse space and then a couple of offices. Um, can we look at that as being uh, compliant with, with the parking requirement for that particular <laughs> Um, yes well, and so no. The complication is since they're being merged, then we look at it as one whole okay. property. So my um, this office is definitely subordinate to right. the industrial use. So the way that we typically do zoning, as, as long as the office is, is clearly subordinate to whatever it is, we, we generally don't parcel that out and require the one for 250. Um, if it's like if you're saying, oh, this is my office and it's, it's for this warehouse area and I still want the one for 5,000, no, 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 no. This is, you know, it needs to be reasonable and it looks like this area, it's 500, and that's subordinate to that. So um, in my review of it, I would not be calling out that extra. Um, so as a question, is it possible to designate this entirely as warehouse, and then this mezzanine would be warehouse, and then the entire first floor would be an industrial use. I don't know the square footages of it and what the... Um, what the total is. Can I, can I address the board? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Excuse me. But you need to speak in the microphone. Okay. Is it okay if I just kind of, as the property owner... Oh, yes. No, no, no. Yeah, you can... You Yes, you're part of the discussion. I'd like to hear from um, you. So we have a very large factory at 8 North Noble Street. It's, 
depend on how you count it, 15 to 20,000 square feet. We have 2,000 amps of power supplied by Edison. Mm -hmm. And we have the entire building filled with industrial machinery, so mm -hmm. large, large machinery. We have a very large dust collector out in the parking lot. It's a 150 horsepower fan, motor. I just want to give you some background. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's never been our intention ever to put machinery over here. The, the logistics, by the time we bring over a compressor, we bring over a dust collector, we hook up the machinery, the logistics are incredible. And we already have an abundance of power, air, everything we need at the other facility. What we don't have is storage space. If you look at our application to Edison, we applied for the smallest meter that Edison will give us. We have a 200 amp single phase and a 200 amp three phase. Why do I have two meters? Because the city requires us to have the potential to charge electric vehicles. <laughs> so the, it's your own folks have requires. Now we do have an electric forklift over there, so we're, we need that three phase power to charge the forklift but it draws 50 amps to charge. So there's virtually no power here to, to set up industrial. When Richard and I started this process nine months ago, Richard's first question to me was, how are you gonna use the building? So I, in, in, we have a long relationship. I've worked with Richard on multiple projects for 30 years, and I, he's a man of great integrity, and, and he knows the rules, and he follows them to my frustration. But <laughs> um, I respect him for that. So I said, Richard, there is a possibility, however unlikely, that at some point in time I may have a crew over there assembling parts. So technically, that may not be a warehouse usage, but it's also not really a manufacturing usage. It may just be a convenience thing where we, where clients ask us to store some things that are knocked down, and then we assemble them. So in full disclosure to you and your staff, uh, maybe I've shot myself in the foot. Maybe I should have just said all warehouse. The office is, is clearly the manager of the, of the facility. That's his little space. But never did I intend to kill myself here in front of you um, we really, and I have some pictures of the warehouse if you'd like to see them, I brought some. We have no intentions, nor do we need the space for assembly. It's, it's just that, that, that rare instance. Mm -hmm. and if I had to have people, even as simple as building crates, let's say, to, to ship something out or something, it's, but I wanted to be very straightforward and honest. We have multiple projects in the city. We've never done anything you know, sleight of hand kind of stuff. So I wanted to be straight. And Richard, in our earlier conversations, the, the 709 is permitted as office, industrial, and warehouse. So he, Richard basically just carried that dis, dis, description through. This other half is, is really just warehouse. Mm -hmm. But I understand how you're reading it, and I understand staff's, I know your name's Kelly, right? Not staff, but... Um, <laughs> I understand the interpretation, but my feeling is any subsequent owner of this property or renter or user would have to apply f for a um, change of use permit or whatever you call that stuff. So, Well, you hit it on the head in that you, your intent and how you're developing it and how you want to use it is one way. A future owner may do a different way, so that's why we need to be clear in the designations of the areas in the building. And if it was all warehouse, the total size is, was this, what is it, 63? Yeah, 63, 17, the total size, that would be for just all warehouse would be one space. Um, so there is room in there for industrial type use, um, but it needs to be clearly designated where the area is. And reviewing your site plan uh, makes a lot more sense with the, the verbal discussion to understand because there is the big roll-up door, which understood you know, it seems more loading and unloading, getting big materials in there, and that, that's the, the reasoning for that. Um, yeah, this is 1,800 square feet approximately on this ground floor, and we could designate that specifically as industrial use. And then the remaining of the, of the build, remainder of the building, including the two mezzanines, could be warehouse space. 
and on the off obviously the office office would be associated with that. Um. Uh, I'm just trying to, like I said, this is a, this is a supportable use. It's a supportable project. This parking that is the, um, the trigger, is the, um, the kicker. And so trying to craft some kind of condition that still allows this to go forward, but recognizing the constraints of the parking, um, that we, in our review of things, we look at it as a whole. We, we didn't, like I said, we don't go parceling out different areas and different areas and different areas. And I like hearing what you're saying. Like if this whole area here is devoted to manufacturing and we have some uh, area that's, you know, walled off that's really the industrial, I'm not sure how that'll work. Um, so when you're, when you're saying well, I, I think to make it easier, we could just designate this whole thing as warehouse and and leave it at that. And then if we come back, I guess they they have the flexibility of coming back later, designating a specific area, walling it off or whatever, and calling that industrial use because they have those additional parking spaces to work with. Can I, can I ask you a question? Mm -hmm. There, there's no planned industrial use, as I've stated. Mm -hmm. Okay. Is it allowed, if, if, if Richard designates this all as warehouse, I'm totally fine with that. Mm -hmm. Is it allowed for me, if, if there's a, a, for instance, we're warehousing these parts and a client wants us to crate them up and, and ship them somewhere, am I allowed to have workers mm -hmm. come over there, put these things in boxes, and ship mm -hmm. them out of the warehouse? Mm -hmm. I mean... Oh, yeah. That is that's the yeah. only scenario that, that I foresee of us, and that's the only reason I ever ask Richard for the, and actually we didn't even add the industrial space. It was already on the permitted building, so we, we just left it on there. We never even addressed it. We just left it on. I, I would be very disappointed to leave this meeting today. Uh, I'm hoping you're going to give us direction here. If you need Richard to re-identify this, we've been in the process nine months now. We contacted Kelly in November for an appointment. We've waited eight weeks, which I understand holidays, a lot of things going on. But we've been dead in the water for eight weeks, and I'm sensing that you're asking Richard to redo this, and maybe we have another hearing with you in no. the future. That's why I'm trying to craft a condition so you don't need to come back. Oh. You'd be working with staff and that um, if necessary, they can check in with me to make sure that it is consistent with my decision. That's called substantial conformance. And I recognize that. I, I would like to keep you moving along in the process and do the next steps. Um, that's why I'm trying to think of a way that we could do this so that it's clear for you guys and then also the public that's watching of what's going to be expected here, that, um, that it's a clear understanding. And, um, and I... Um, well, I think we'd be fine with the warehouse use as okay. long as there's the understanding that someday somebody could come to, along and, and actually do an industrial portion of this. Mm -hmm. So then, yeah, have, uh, it's a the almost 3,000 square foot addition of warehouse to the existing building. Yes. Okay. Um, And one other thing I might mention, um, we had talked to Tim Downey about the tree placement on this property, mm -hmm. and apparently there's some flexibility as where this tree is located, you know, and if we contact Tim about moving it to adjacent property, he said that's fine as long as we get the adjacent property's permission. So I'd like to kind of make it an option about the, the placement of the tree. This one or the new one? The well, new one. The new, the one? new tree. Yeah. That's fine. It's in the public right of way, so yes. that it, it, it worked with the design board and okay. uh, public works. Okay. So yeah, in terms of my coastal permit, uh, that's that's fine. If it was on your property, it was in the uh, the front area. This doesn't have a front setback, but um, it does. Oh, it does. Yeah. Which one is it? This is all part of the drainage system. Oh, okay. It's curved, yeah. Okay. Yeah, if it was on your private property.
property that um, you may have more comments, but it's in the public right of way, and so work with them. It's fine. Great, thank you. Okay, so uh, and you've uh, as part of the coastal permit and development plan. There's conditions you've read them all and understand them all. Yes. Okay. So, um, like I said, the development plan it meets the findings for the development plan um, with the change that it is a, a warehouse uh, use. And um, in regards to the coastal permit, this area of the coastal zone is recognized as industrial uses. There's not really any major coastal issues um, as long as you take care of your traffic and your parking. Um, and you've gone to design review board, so it is consistent with our coastal plan. So given that, um, I can make the findings outlined in the staff report. And those include the CEQA determination as well as the development plan findings and the coastal development permit. And approve your project as we discussed today. And my action is appealable to the Planning Commission within 10 calendar days. And they also have oversight authority of all my actions. And if they felt this warranted additional discussion before them, they could call it up during that same 10-day review period. And if either of those actions would happen, Kathy, or Kathy, sorry, Kelly would contact you. Okay, thank you. Great, thanks. And I adjourn the meeting. Thank you very off. much. Mike's okay.